Good morning and uh, welcome to this week's Learn with Lorna, the 66th in the series where we're looking at hill walking and climbing. My name is Lorna Steele. Uh, if, the, if there's people watching who have never watched before, then uh, welcome. It's lovely to have you with us. Uh, I'm the Community Engagement Officer with the Highland Archive Service. The Highland Archive Service uh, looks after historic archive material for the whole of the Highlands in its four offices. So we have the Highland Archive and Registration Centre in Inverness. We have Sky and Lochalsh Archive Centre in Portree, Loch Aber Archive Centre in Fort William, and Nucleus, the Nuclear and Caithness Archives in Wick. And across all of those, we hold collections relating to the Highlands. Before I start uh, telling this week's uh, set of stories, to remind you that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. That High Life Highland is uh, a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in these but if you're able to donate towards our work then we're truly grateful for that and there's a link to be able to do so in the body of the text of this film. It's nice to see everybody saying hello. Um, where have we got? Edinburgh, Sky, um, Australia. I know you're in lockdown now Jenny. Creef, hi Anne. So this week we're moving on from um, June's theme of landscape and environment and into July's which is going to be sport and leisure collections. This week the subject I've picked for this week really crosses very well over those two subjects um, because it's hill walking and climbing so obviously it's a sport and leisure pursuit that happens entirely in the landscape and environment so it's a nice one to move across. I don't know if there's anyone watching um, who is a hill walker or a climber or a mountaineer. If you are please do say hello tell us some of your own stories and share some of your favourite places as well. It'd be lovely to, to hear that. I have mentioned several times before that I grew up at the foot of the Cairngorms. So um, we did hill walking, mountaineering, climbing and things as part of our PE lessons in school, um, which certainly instilled a respect for the mountains, I would say. Um, not something I do a huge amount of, but um, it is... Uh, it's something that we that we did at school. So, and mountains and hills, of course, are so much associated with that image of the Highlands. And I've already done a session on stories from the mountains. So, if you haven't watched that, please do um, go back and and have a look at that one. But this week, I want to do some stories more specifically about sport in the mountains. So, uh, leisure pursuits: climbing, walking, discovering, exploring. But having, having said that, um, I'm going to start by talking about, po pointing out the fact that for many years, the mountains of the Highlands and Islands weren't seen at all as a tempting place to explore for, for pleasure and, and leisure. They were often seen by both locals and visitors as uh, inhospitable places, frightening, awe-inspiring and impregnable. And all these words appear in, in early records when they're talking about, um, about, the, about mountains. There's that image of mountains being connected to gods or to myths. Um, and people often really needed to have a, a, a real serious reason to go up uh, these, uh, the biggest of the mountains. And the first statistical accounts for the parishes of Edra Hillis in Sutherland and Kintail on the west coast of Ross and Cromarty really kind of convey this feeling about the mountainous landscape. And I wanted to, to read those to you initially. So the first one from Edra Hillis in Sutherland. It says, um, the face of, the, of this country, like the rest of the highlands, is mountainous and rocky, and to a stranger, shockingly rugged. The more inland parts, which constitute Lord Ray's deer forest, are nothing but a vast group of dreadful mountains, with their summits piercing the clouds, and divided only by deep and very narrowed valleys, whose declivities are so rugged and steep as to be dangerous to travellers not furnished with guides. These inhabited place, the inhabited places are only those next to the sea and some other on the confines of the forest which happen to be somewhat level and there can be used for uh, rearing cattle or the culture of corn. And towards the coast the ruggedness of the ground be less and the mountains seemingly subside or at least present a less awful and horrid appearance. So there's very much a... Um, that, that image of... And of course the, the words uh, horrid and the words uh, awful have changed their meaning over the last couple of hundred years. That, that's much more used to refer to awe-inspiring as opposed to awful, as we would think about it. But that image of them being something other and uh, intimidating. The first statistical account from the parish of Kintail in, um, down in the, uh, the west coast reads like this. 
Kintail is on every quarter surrounded by high hills. The most eminent is Tullochard, which commands a view of many of the Hebridean islands. This mountain claims particular attention on account of the veneration it was held in in ancient times. Like the Temple of Janus, it indicated peace or war. The voice of hostility was sure to roar on its summit, for when war commenced, a burning barrel of tar on the highest ridge was the signal, and the vassals and tenants of Seaforth would appear the next morning, armed pro arasit fowis, so for God and country, at the castle of Don. So that's... Um, image of the mountain being held in, in veneration and yes people went up there to put that um, burning barrel of tar on there to signal war but that is a you know a serious uh, important reason to go up as opposed to for leisure and exploration the other thing that mountains could be seen as is part of an area's def uh, defenses natural defenses because um we've spoken a lot in the past few weeks um just happened to have come up in the last few weeks about hill forts and castles and those buildings that are constructed on those high viewpoints for defence reasons. But also the bulk of our mountains themselves, just the, the physical presence of the mountain, can often provide, provide a physical barrier or a place to hide. And the first statistical account for the parish of Moy and Delaracy, which is just outside Inverness, um, really conveys this really well. So it says... The ancient name of this area is Starsach Nagal, i.e. the threshold of the Gales or the Highlanders, being the pass by which the Highlanders entered to the low country, so narrow between high mountains that a few men could defend it against numbers. It was of great consequence to the proprietor in those times as he could make inroads into the low country and could easily prevent any pursuit beyond that pass. He could likewise hinder any of the neighbouring clans from passing this place without his consent. So that um, kind of image that you get is that the mountains are not places of pleasure. But that starts to change in the, about the 1800s and we start to really see this change in the highlands and also out with. Um, before I tell some of those stories, I'm going to read one final statistical account entry. This is from the second statistical account from the parish of Strath in Skye. And I wanted to share it with you because I think it's beautifully written. I think it's really evocative. I think it really conjures up a picture of the scene that people were seeing in uh, in Sky, and the way their their viewpoint of it was starting to change uh, towards the mountains being a place of discovery where you could pit yourself against nature, where you could challenge yourself. And I think it paints a really lovely picture of that mighty Cullen Range and, and the image of Sky. So this is Parish of Strath in the 1840s. Topographical appearances. To the admirer of nature, this parish presents objects of no ordinary interest. On its western boundary, it is situated in a landscape of unparalleled grandeur. No place, perhaps, affords more picturesque subjects for the painter than parts of this parish. In it, he meets such a prodigality of natural wonders that he must feel as if bewildered and at a loss to make a choice. The scenery shifts at every step, and each successive view seems to excel the rest. The cloud-capped Cullen raises its inaccessible pinnacles beyond the other mountains, and is visible in almost every part of the island. Next, in order, Marsco, Blavin and Bellig shoot themselves forth in every variety of fantastic figure and appearance, each struggling for supremacy with its neighbour, and each possessing every imaginable characteristic of native rudeness and grandeur. On entering the Bay of Skavig, the spectator is struck with the rag rugged outline presented by the spiry and serrated peaks of the lofty Cullen. It is um, a really beautiful description, I think, and you can see there they're starting to talk about the mountains for painters, for, um, for pleasure. So the Cullen uh, range that's referred to in that, um, uh, in that e extract is uh, a range of mountains in Skye, comprising the Black Coolin Ridge, and then the slightly lower uh, Red Coolins. They provide some of the best and most challenging uh, climbs in the whole of the UK. There are um, uh, buttresses, there are pinnacles, there are very narrow ridgeways to walk, uh, she says, not having done them, clearly. Um, but they are some very, very famous and appealing uh, sites to climbers. There are 11 or 12 Munros within 
uh, the Cullen range. Now I say 11 or 12 because there's some debate about whether Blavin should be counted uh, in that or not because it's slightly removed. A Munro, for those of you who don't know, is a Scottish mountain over 910 metres. The highest peak within the Cullen range is Skirralister at 992 metres. Now, until the 1800s, it was believed generally that the Cullen were unclimbable. Um, and it, the first recorded climb of them wasn't until 1836. Now, one of the things I will always kind of preface that kind of statement is, is it's the first recorded climb. Um, so I'm not saying there were never climbs before that, but certainly not commonly, if at all. So that first climb was done in July 1836 by a local man, a forester, Duncan McIntyre, and the geologist James Forbes. And the peak that they climbed in that year was Skirnangian. At 964 metres, it's the fifth highest in the Cullen Range. And they went via the southeast ridge. Now McIntyre and Forbes returned again in 1845, so uh, about 10 years later, to conquer another peak and again they went up Skirnagian and this time they went by another route. In 1873, so you start to see uh, at this period the, the growing interest in this as a, as a hobby, as a pursuit and as a huge exploration, I think we sometimes underestimate that now, this is this is not um, really just an aimless hobby, this this is pioneering, um, going to places that people have possibly never been before. And so in 1873, there were the first ascents of other peaks within the Cullen Range, so Skir um, Skir Derek and Skir Alistair in 1873. Now Skir Alistair was climbed first by Sheriff Alexander Nicholson, and anyone who is a Gaelic speaker um, first of all, apologies for my pronunciations if they're terrible. Um, but also, if you're a Gaelic speaker, you'll hear me saying Skur Alistair there. Um, that was named after Sheriff Alexander Nicholson and his first ascent, because Alistair is the Gaelic for Alexander. And you may remember, um, if you were watching when I did Crofters and, Crofters and Cotters Week, that I spoke a little bit uh, about Sheriff Nicholson that week, because he was one of those charged to with the commission of uh, investigating Crofters um living conditions. And although I'm, I'm talking there about uh, McIntyre, Forbes, um, uh, Nicholson, and those early pioneers are still known and you can certainly find out information about them online if you're interested to do so, but the names most associated with the climbing in Skye are Collie and Mackenzie. Now I will come on and tell you about Collie and Mackenzie after I've paused uh, slightly early to remind you that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. That High Life Highland um, is a charity registered in Scotland and that there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series. But as I always say, if you're able to donate towards our work, then we're very, very grateful for that. OK, so John Mackenzie came from Sconcer in Skye and he had made um, he made the first uh, ascent of Skirna Gredi when uh, in 1870 when he was only 14 years old along with William Newton tribe he was only 14 years old and he had first climbed Skirnagian the one I mentioned uh, previously at the age of 10 and he went on to become uh, a guide he was a crofter and, and a guide at a time when more people were starting to venture into those hills more people but not most people um, I think that's an important distinction and over the coming years he would undertake uh, a huge range of important, significant climbs, um, taking peaks for the first time, taking, um, making significant ascents. In 1880, the inaccessible pinnacle had been climbed first by the notable mountaineering brothers, Charles and Lawrence Pilkington. Um, but Mackenzie would complete the second ascent of it a year later in 1881. And then in 1887, he was the first to reach the summit of Skur Mekoinyech. Um, and again, those who uh, speak Gaelic will have heard in that, hopefully, um, the name of that mountain, Skur Mekoinyech, Mackenzie's Peak. So that was named after him, following that ascent, which he made again with Charles Pilkington. Um, and I think it's important to think about this, you know, I don't know what you're picturing in your head, but um, the, the people doing these climbs are not wearing <laughs> what we would climb now to do this. They are by and large in, in tweed suits, they're in hobnail boots. Um, anyone who has um, who has been out on the hills in the rain will know you really want to be in the ideal clothing. And 
and tweed when it gets wet you know it's it doesn't get wet too quickly but when it does it's heavy um and so i think we just need to bear that in mind as well these are people pi going pioneering into new places um in not the best conditions as we would maybe see it now so i've mentioned there mckenzie climbing uh, with with various people um and he did take take on climbs with, with a range of people, but it was his friendship and his partnership with Professor Norman Colley, which was the one that would really lead to the two men um, really leaving their mark on the story of, of mountaineering and climbing and hill walking in Scotland and particularly in the Highlands. Now, Professor Colley was a, an eminent scientist, he was a chemist, and he was already a climber. He had climbed um, a range of mountains. He came from Alderley Edge, just near Manchester. Um, but he was keen to explore the Cullen Range after visiting Skye in the 1880s with his brother. And according to the story, he and his brother were inspired to climb Skurnagian. After sitting in the Sleekakin Hotel uh, and watching two people on the side of the mountain. And they went on to attempt the climb, they attempted it twice before, uh, unsuccessfully, before they approached uh, Mackenzie and asked him, uh, enlisted his, his help and his a huge amount of local knowledge and that meeting and that climb led to such a strong bond forming between Collie and Mackenzie and the two men went on to be very firm friends and spent many many years climbing together in the Cullen Range discovering um, new peaks, discovering new features uh, and mapping the landscape and new routes and we have some images of this um, of, of these mountains and these routes in our Sky and Loch Alsh collection and also some wonderful images on Ambala if you are able to have a look at that after this. But perhaps Collie and Mackenzie's most famous discovery was uh, the Coit, the Kioch, the Kioch, uh, or the Kioch Askumen, which um, is a huge pinnacle of rock, 871 metres high, sticking out from the side of Thron de Kiche. Um, this discovery was made in 1906. Fabulous story. They had seen a shadow uh, on another rock face and couldn't work out where the shadow had come from. They were determined to try and identify what was causing this shadow. And so they discovered um, the Kioch. And the pinnacle was named by Mackenzie and the rock face named by Collie. And if you can't picture it, certainly Google it at C-I-O-C-H. You'll get a very quick image of it. But also, if you're familiar with the 1986 film Highlander, then you'll have seen it in that because it was a setting for a sword fight that Sean Connery got um, uh, flown into. Collie continued to travel around the world. He climbed in the Himalayas, he climbed in the Alps and, and various other ranges. But um, whereas Mackenzie's loyalty was uh, entirely to the Coolin range. Um, but but Collie spent his summers at Glenbrittle House and at the Sleekican Inn, where towards the end of his life, he lived permanently. Mackenzie uh, died in 1933 and then Collie in 1942 and the two men are buried side by side within sight of the Coolin Range, which um, is lovely, I think. And last year, after many years of hard work and, and fundraising, the Collie and Mackenzie Heritage Group, who we have worked alongside with in our Sky and Loch Alsh uh, Archive Centre, um, they're based in Mackenzie's hometown of uh, home community of Sconser. They were able to erect an absolutely beautiful and a very moving statue, I think, of Collie and Mackenzie at the foot of the Coolins, looking up at the hills. Um, it's the work of the artist Stephen Tinney. It is absolutely beautiful. I really encourage you to look it up. It really conveys something very atmospheric about these two men and their pioneering work exploring the Coolin range and and what it meant to them. Another famous climber who's represented in our collections uh, is Colin Dodgson, whose uh, climbing diaries are held in Inverness in the Highland Archive Centre. Colin Dodgson was born in around 1910 and he lived in the beautiful Lake District um, village of Grasmere. I don't know if we've got any people watching from that part of the world, an absolutely beautiful part of the world. And he ran a tea shop there and, and several shops and of course was surrounded by mountains uh, in the Lake District. And he was a passionate climber and hill walker. Um, and by the early 1950s, he had already climbed every Scottish Munro, as well as all the main peaks in England and Wales. So quite an achievement. And his passion really comes across in his diaries. 
the diary volumes, um, they are his just his climbing diaries, so I don't know if he kept a separate set of, of diaries or... Um, but these climbing diaries really convey his passion for climbing, his um, connection to the mountains and the hills. They also give an image of a kind of frantic pace of travelling the country to climb. Every day it seems like he's moving around the country to, to conquer another hill. The extracts in these diaries cover um, from the 1920s um, through a sort of 40-50 year period, cover many locations in the Highlands and right across um, different parts of the UK. And as I said, you really get a sense of Colin Dodgson's passion for the hills and his connection to the hills. And a few things that I picked up as I was looking through them, um, I think you get a real sense of um, of the risks, even on a small and comparatively easy walk. And that's something that we see every year in the Highlands. Um, people, Some people who come entirely prepared, but the weather hits or something changes. Some people who don't come prepared at all and don't really understand the, the huge dangers associated with, with climbing in our mountains. So you get that in his diaries. You get a sense of the important emotional connection to the hills and you also get a sense of the importance of relationships in climbing. And again, if any of you are watching who, who are climbers, I'm sure you'll be able to attest to this. Um, that Collie and Mackenzie relationship, the Pilkington brothers climbing together. Um, and you get that in Colin Dodgson's diaries at the importance of having a person with you. That's obviously a safety thing, but it's also a shared experience thing. So I wanted to um, read a few extracts for you. So this one comes from the 1st of January 1964 and talks about um, a low level walk. Um, so January the 1st, 1964, with David, car to Fort William, Robin's friend joined us at Loch Lomond. So this is New Year's Day, of course. The 2nd of January. Very, very wet and windy. Got the car to Prince Charlie's Monument, so at Glenfinnan. Came back to Fort William and then up Glen Nevis. Had lunch in car. All the waterfalls were terrific. Decided to go up Glen Nevis at 3pm. Gorge very full of water. Went on the wire bridge at Stoll which, if any of you are familiar with, is a, um, a very narrow wire bridge that goes across a, a, a course of water. Coming down, I stepped on a large boulder, nearly a ton, and it fell, and me with it. And I can really um, envisage that, that he's standing up on this huge boulder, thinking it's completely immovable, and I'm sure we've all done that, and this boulder of nearly a ton rolled and he fell with it. He says, hurt my shoulder, but I'm very, very lucky to be no worse as I fell over 10 feet. Um, on the third, still very wet, but wind abating. Went in the car via Banavi and Clunes to Loch Arkig and right along the shore to Glendessery. So, as I say, that's a relatively low level uh, walk. Also, I find it very surprising. He decided at 3 p.m. in January to go <laughs> to go to the waterfall. It must have been almost dark. Um, so that's one. And then that takes us to the 1st, 2nd and 3rd of January that year, 1964. The following day, on the 4th of January, he was climbing in Glenshiel. And he says, weather damp at first and then gradually cleared into a perfect day. The view down Loch Shiel was glorious. Very fine ridge, especially the last three tops. But reached the heart of the glen at 4.15, waded the river, made way down with difficulty... Uh, made way with difficulty down the glen in gathering darkness and was fortunate to find the track. Reached the hook road, hungry and tired at 5.45. A wonderful day. So again, you get that sense of this is a very, very experienced climber saying, I was fortunate that I found the track again and was able to get out. I've mentioned that there are entries in these diaries relating to all sorts of different places, but I particularly like this next one from 19, uh, 1987. Ari, uh, the Cairngorms, so he's walking in the Cairngorms at this point. Um, so I would have been a couple of miles away from him at this moment, uh, unbeknownst to both of us, I'm sure. Um, but this is the walk, um, this is where I was walking with the school maybe eight, nine years later. Okay, so 3rd of August with Jill, so this is his daughter. Car to Loch Morlick in the Cairngorms to camp. Car to hire car park for ski lift then east over two small burns to Chalamine Gorge. 
through the gorge to join the Larig Gru, Sinclair Hut, and then up ridge over uh, Strom the Larig, both tops, and then on to the main summit of Breiriach, 4,248 feet, returning by the same route. So that's quite a substantial uh, amount of walking to do. The next sentence, wonderful day, glorious to be back again after 56 years and delighted to still be able to reach the summit at 77 years of age. My first visit was in dense mist, but this time it was a very fine day, rare in 1987. Chalamain Gorge very rocky with large boulders making it slow going. I reached the top without much difficulty. The only time I was really tired was on the final climb up to the car park through thick heather and clouds of abominable midges. Fortunately, the midges in tents at the car park were not in evidence at the campsite, so we enjoyed a well-earned supper sitting outside in the late evening, 9.30 till 10. It was a day I shall always remember. I climbed Breiriach on my first visit to Scotland with Tim in October 1931. And then he says the next morning we had a very pleasant walk to Loch Anoigne, the Green Lochan, in warm sunshine, and then to home that afternoon via Creef. I... Um, I love that. I love that moment of him saying, you know, this is a, this is a day I will remember all my life. Um, I also love the abominable midges. But he mentions in that extract being uh, 77 years old. Now, by this point, Colin Dodgson had been interviewed by the BBC about his achievement of having climbed uh, all mountains over 2,000 metres in England, Scotland and Wales at the age of 75. So he had done many of them before and then did them all again at the age of 75. Um, if you remember when we spoke about Marivor and we were all like, right, we get to 50, that's when we start achieving all sorts of things. Well, I'm here to tell you, 77, also a good age. Now, incidentally, um, Colin Dodgson, along with his friend Tim Tyson, who he mentioned in that extract, um, also accomplished another feat. They uh, accomplished the feat of swimming in every tarn, so every sort of mountain loch and mountain lake uh, in the Lake District, which they concluded, but by the time they had finished, was 534 tarns and 195 pools. And he does sound like a bit of a character because they did all of these mountain loch swims uh, naked slightly by mistake because they had done the first one naked because they needed to take their clothes off, keep them dry and had gone in for a dip on a hot day. And then it became a matter of pride, apparently, that as they continued uh, ticking them off, they had to carry on doing them with no clothes on. Um, Colin Dodgson died in 1991, um, but his love of the mountains lives on through these diaries. And I wanted to round off um, by reading to you an extract from uh, the reminiscences of Duncan McTavish, which is a very small document, a few pages long, that we hold in our Loch Abra Archive Centre. It talks um, about uh, climbing a hill in, in, near Arnestale, uh, Kyle of Loch Alsh Way. Um, and the reason I wanted to finish with this one is this is someone who is not a, uh, an experienced climber particularly. This is not someone who's um, a climber in the way that Collie and Mackenzie or Colin Dodgson is, but this is really conveys just the excitement and the experience of being in the hills. And also I love the fact that you'll see he doesn't even finish the walk. And we've talked a lot about people who are achieving firsts or achieving um, ticking off all of something. This one is, you know, potentially a failed mission in some respects. He doesn't make it to the top, but that's not the point. The point is his absolute passion and, and the excitement for doing it. And so I wanted to finish um, by sharing this with you, because I think I would imagine most of us have not uh, bun been Munro bagging or got them all. Um, but we will all have, I hope, experienced something similar to this feeling. Thursday, November the 8th. It was a brilliantly beautiful day with not a cloud in the sky. I knew this was the day to climb the hillside up the school barn to the dam where I had last been over 50 years ago with Callum before we left Arnestale, where Dad used to go for the wood or to fish up the barn with Callum all night. But it must have been dangerous. I went through the school garden and over the wall at the back, then over to that lovely barn, a little change now. The old trees were gone and mainly saplings are there now. The cow's heavy hooves have made the ground all lumpy, 
but still the stream flows clear over stones and shelves that make a rill in one place with a splashing sound. I couldn't find the lovely big mossy stone with the, gu- with the violet below it, but on my way back I found a green sycamore leaf to place underside down in the water to show that magical silvery transformation that I had viewed with bated breath so long ago. The waterfall with pool below that I discovered with beating heart and that seemed so large from a child's height now seemed tiny and it was the lowest in a series of three small stepped cascades in the cleft between the sylvan sides of the burn. It was precipitous, dangerous to go up and up, still through the wind and the bracken, grasping at slender trunks and often on hands and knees. Away up there was another high waterfall and one followed uh, the rusty old pipeline that had been there before. The dam was all filled in. Later Len told me that you can only see it from below. The sheep were grazing only a few in a sloping ravine on my left and the wonderful sound of water trickling and rushing gurgling and splashing and roaring and thundering delighted my ears. I crawled up the steep hillside over the bent grass, hampered by the blinding sun and hoping that I wouldn't lose an eye through the rusty old steep uh, fence wire lying about. At length I thought that prudence in the mountains should gain ascendancy over my desire to go on up and up. And so I rested, vertically leaning back against the steep slope and just took in the beauty of the loch with its blue sheen in the glaring sunshine and the hills in dark blue shadow on the other side. I would have liked to have seen the panorama all the way to Kinlochorn, but for that I'd have had to get to the summit. Anyway, I moved round to the other burn with a red holly tree in the shadow, a red berry holly tree in the shadow, and came down it to the fence, then through the long pink bracken to the old wall, across it to MacDonald's little green powerhouse, and so on down the burn again. Home to rest and eat. It was exhilarating. I love that. I think that is such an evocative um, little piece of writing. I hope uh, you've enjoyed a, a kind of whistle-stop tour through some of some of the documents we hold relating to mountain mountaineering, climbing and walking. Um, I hope it's inspired you to go out and, and, and explore. If you do, please do it carefully and do everything right and take maps and compasses. And um, It is... Um, it can be a very inhospitable and dangerous environment, but there's a huge amount to be uh, discovered there. I hope you've enjoyed that. I hope you can join me next week. We'll be moving indoors to look at uh, theatres, cinemas and the arts in our collections as another of our sport and leisure um, themed weeks. A reminder that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. That High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and that there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series. But if you're able to donate towards our work, then um, we really do appreciate that. The final thing I'd like to say will will only apply to some of you, but um, it's to push another project I'm involved in with at the moment. I'm working with Central Primary School to mark their 200th anniversary. Um, If any of you went to Central Primary School in Inverness or if you know anybody who did, please do encourage them to have a look uh, at the, the new Facebook page Central have set up or their website. They're looking to share memories and build an archive going forward. So um, if you if you have a connection to Central Primary, then please do pursue that. Thank you so much and I'll speak to you next week.